Ahoy hoy everybody and welcome to another video in my series where I listen to classic albums for the first time and today's album is an album that Q Magazine rated the sixth best album of the 1970s and that's Tubula, <laughs> Tubular Bells by Mike Oldfield. So I know the Exorcist bit of this. Um, other than that my collection if you like with Mike Oldfield is limited. Uh, my dad had an album of his which I was going to double check which one it was before I started recording and forgot so I will put it on the screen which one he had. Um, I vividly recall the cover. I don't ever recall having heard the album. Possibly I have and if I were ever to hear it again I'd get a Proustian rush and suddenly go back to my childhood. But I don't knowingly or haven't knowingly heard it. I own the seven inch single of his Blue Peter theme back to Portsmouth and that's about it. Um, I have a little silly bugbear with him that sort of put me off exploring his music further and it really is silly. Um, Moonlight Shadow. Really good song however 4am in the morning as opposed to 4am at night <clears throat> annoys me tautology um four o'clock in the morning would have scanned so because of that silly little thing that always bugs me whenever i hear that song it sort of put me off exploring his music a bit but i will put that to the back of my mind as i listen to tubular bells his debut album I'm sure most of you are familiar with it uh, this release i picked up from one of the Universal Group websites, Record Store or Sound of Vinyl, one of those. Um, they did a little pre-sell, they had some coloured vinyl releases coming out and they did a pre-sell and I picked up two. Uh, this one and the one that will be the subject of my next first listen to. Uh, this is on grey vinyl, I think. Um, I know they were pretty cheap, I think they were possibly 14 99 each. Uh, so we've got sleeve notes all about how it came to be which I haven't read, I will at some point. And yeah, as I say, it's on grey vinyl, solid grey. So yeah, I, you know, I, I know it's mostly instrumental. There are some limited vocals on there, I believe. Uh, obviously, Mike Oldfield played all the instruments. He was 19 when he recorded it, I know that much. It's the first release on Virgin. It is responsible for Richard Branson's fortune, basically, and everything he's done since, good or bad. Um, but yeah, looking forward to giving it a listen. I'll be back with you in a second, having listened to it. Okay, very much an album of two halves for me. Uh, I'll start by saying this was not a great pressing. Uh, side one in particular was very noisy. It it got very fuzzy at times. Uh, side 2 much better but a few pops and clicks. Uh, but it, it wasn't so bad that it would detract from my opinion of the music. And my opinion is part 1. Um, so it opens with the Exorcist bit which you know obviously I already knew and that's great and it's a simple re repetitive riff on the keys, the piano I believe. Um, and then the other instruments gradually join in and that goes on and on and that goes on for about five minutes and I was bored of it by the end of the five minutes um, but then it eventually goes into a more acoustic section but although it does pop up a little bit in the background throughout the first side um, there's a section there that reminds, reminds me very much of The End of My Love by Paul McCartney and then it goes into a faster, rockier section, but the guitar solo on it isn't the greatest guitar solo I've ever heard. And there's a very bassy section, then an acoustic section. And um, that section, the guitar sounds dodgy. I don't know if it was out of tune or it was just strange chords being played, but it really didn't sit right with me. Um, and by this stage it just sounded like he was taking each instrument he could get his hands on and thinking right what can I play with this and I don't mean 
you know, what are the many options are there that I can play with this? It was, this is all I can play on this instrument, so I'll stick this bit in here. I'm not saying that is the case, but that's what it felt like to me. Um, and I started getting bored. There was no sort of cohesion. It didn't flow naturally in between all the sections. Um, so at this stage, I started reading the liner notes, I'm afraid, um, which at least informed me that my golfer doesn't play all the instruments on this. There are other people playing instruments. Um, yeah, it's just, I say, it was just all so very random and nothing seemed to flow properly into each other. Um, yeah, it wasn't going well for me. Then at the end it picked up a bit because Viv Stanshaw came in, which deliberately reminded me of the intro and the outro, and I love Bonzos, so that picked it up a bit and that all seemed to flow a lot better and you've got the, the little bit of vocals at the end so it did improve at the end so I liked the very start but that went on too long and I liked the very end but the bit in the middle did nothing for me whatsoever as I say it just seemed like random picking up instruments and playing what he could on them and there was no sort of flow to it so at this stage I thought oh dear then we had part two and I much preferred part two um, it all seemed to flow together a lot better. It's a, a, another simple riff to start this, but this time played on a guitar. And that into, went into a really pretty acoustic section, uh, acoustic guitar, really lovely melody, really liked that. Maybe went on a tad too long, but overall really liked that section. Um, I was trying to work out what it was reminding me of and it was a bit of music at the end of series three of A League of Gentlemen written by Joby Talbot that it reminded me of in, in parts. Uh, then it goes into an organ piece, still pretty, um, there's some vocals come in um, with a sort of a chanty type vocal. Um, then there's a mandolin or a ballad like her, uh, it's sped up so much it was difficult to tell but um, that came in, and there was a very, very brief bit of guitar that really sounded like it could have been Brian May, but that was literally, you know, ten bars, if that. Um, and that then dissolves into the double speed guitar, which had a, the solo it was playing had a bit of a sea shanty, folky type air, which was nice, but I'm not a big lover of a double speed guitar. It's all a bit too high for me, and you sort of lose the joy of the guitar. Um, but otherwise, liked that section, the sea shanty style to it was nice. Uh, then some kettle drums come in, and it's nice to actually hear some proper drums on it, and then into even a drum kit. And we get a nice poppy section, which is known as the caveman section, due to Mike Oldfield's vocals on it. But yeah, it's, it's a proper song type section, although not vocally, but the arrangement, the instruments uh, really nice goes into a rock bit um, with some howling vocals and it goes back into the poppy section then back into the rock section and then it just it pretty much stops even though it's meant to be one continuous piece of music but just as it fades right out, well it doesn't even fade it just as it cuts right out an organ comes in and picks it up and it's just a simple organ chords uh, with a nice guitar solo over it, which again, as I say, nice, nice solo, well played, nice tone to it, nice melody. Again, it was just starting to get a bit too long, but then the organ comes back in and saves it. Um, and it, it climaxes, and then there is a definite stop, but very brief. And then the sailor's hornpipe plays, which is great. <laughs> I love this version of it. I love, you know. I, I'm a Pompey boy, I, Pompey Portsmouth, you know, I, I have naval heritage all around me, so a, a good sea shanty, not this new trend for sea shanties, but a proper sea shanty um, being played on guitar, fine by me. So yeah, ends really well. Um, so yes, as I say, side one didn't do much for me, apart from the very beginning and the end. Side 2 liked a lot better, I would happily sit and listen to Side 2 time and time again. <sighs> Unlikely to listen to Side 1 much. Has it made me think, oh I must go out and get more Mike Oldfield? Definitely not. 
Um, yeah, don't think I would get any more. Possibly the album my dad had, just out of curiosity. But um, yeah, otherwise, it didn't do much for me overall. I'd say side, side two I liked, but not enough to make me think, oh, well, I'll forgive side one and, um, you know, pursue the rest of the catalogue. Yeah. So is it a classic album? Not for me. Um, interestingly, you know, as I said, it was number six in Q Magazine's best albums of the 1970s, but it's not on, a, well, certainly according to Wikipedia, it's not on any of the, you know, all-time classic albums lists, you know, it's specifically on that 70s list, and also uh, Q, Q and Mojo did a joint special on Pink Floyd and Progressive Rock, and it was, it charted in there fairly near the top in that little chart as well. But I couldn't find any reference it, to it being in, you know, the top five, Rolling Stones top 500 or even Q's all time top 100, 500, whatever. Um, yeah, so it seems that possibly people agree and it's not quite a classic. But I'm glad I've heard it. You know, I'm, it's an album I've read a lot about and over the years and I'm obviously very familiar with that cover. So I'm glad now I can finally say yes, I know what that sounds like. Yeah, but overall, wasn't overly impressed. Okay, so yeah, that's it for this video. If you have any suggestions for any classic albums that are on classic albums lists that you think I should listen to, please let me know. Either in the comments below, by email, which is... Uh, yeah, email which is in the description below, as is my Twitter, you can contact me on there, or my Instagram, again, you can message me through there. Um, thank you for watching, like, comment and subscribe, and I'll see you in another video. Thanks, bye. <music>